this morning to Jonah chapter 3. That's on page 774 of the Church Bible. Jonah chapter 3. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Let yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. <clears throat> the word reached <clears throat> the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his wicked way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. We saw last time as we came to this third chapter of the book of Jonah that the narrative is being driven by two questions. What is going to happen to Jonah and what is going to happen to Nineveh? This third chapter records the surprising works of God as he begins to answer those questions. We saw last time that the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. That was a surprise. That was completely unexpected and undeserved. Here is a man, a prophet of God, who has had a useful ministry as a prophet in Israel, and yet at the moment that God spoke to him the first time, chapter 1, verse 1, 2, he disobeys God, flat out disobeys God and goes in his own direction and uh, uh, without any hesitation goes as far away from where God wants him to be as possible. And there was a supernatural work done in Jonah's life. You remember he was thrown off the boat. That fish, famous fish, was there ready to catch him and then to dive with him inside its belly and then eventually throw him up on dry land. You all know the story. Whether we know what it means is another matter altogether. And now we're going to read the story of Nineveh. We're going to see that in Nineveh there's going to be this great revival, this great work of God in changing the hearts of the people of this city and rescue them. And both of these events, the story of Jonah and the story of Nineveh, are going to illustrate a principle that you find stated right at the very end of Jonah's prayer which is recorded in chapter 2. The principle says this, salvation belongs to the Lord. The word salvation is a rescue word. Salvation, deliverance, rescue belongs to the Lord. Whether you're thinking of Jonah thrown overboard and drowning and rescued by means of that fish, whether you're thinking of Nineveh under the judgment of God and repenting, and God relenting from sending the judgment. Or whether you're thinking of yourself, you and I in this room today, and our relationship with God, when we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are saved from death, hell, and are given eternal life. 
That's the reality uh, of the work of salvation. And in all those kinds of saving, salvation belongs to the Lord. It is His work from beginning to end. So the word of the Lord then comes a second time to Jonah. And the word of the Lord is the same as the first time. As we learned last week, when God speaks to you and you don't like it, and He leaves you alone to the consequences of your, of your actions or attitudes, and there comes a time when God comes and speaks to you again, don't expect that when He comes a second time that He's going to have to modify or has modified or changed in any way what He said to you the first time. God's Word remains the same. He doesn't change in His Word. And so the Word of God comes a second time to Jonah, and it says, he says the same thing. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. Here is Jonah. He's being called to take the Word of God seriously. He's being told, called to fulfill his ministry. He is to go to this city, and he's to call out against it. He is to preach the message that God has put on his lips. And how do you preach a message like that? Well, Paul puts it like this, by setting forth the truth plainly. We commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And that's what we see Jonah doing. He goes to Nineveh, and he delivers the message. Here is the message. It's pithy, short, clear, punchy. The message is simply this. In 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. You have 40 days until you're nuked, is basically the message that God gave to Jonah to preach to Nineveh. Well, you say, isn't it wonderful that that's not the message that we have to say to Philadelphia or any of the other cities of this country? But in fact, I don't think that the message that Jonah delivers to Nineveh is very far removed from the message that we have to deliver to the inhabitants of this city or any other city in these United States or any other uh, country of the world. Do you remember the Apostle Paul? He goes to Athens, that center of culture, that intellectual capital of the world. And what does he say to those people? God has appointed a day in which He will judge the world by that man whom He has appointed, Jesus Christ. God has appointed a day for judgment. Or you listen to Jesus Himself as He's regularly telling the people of Ju Judah and Jerusalem that there is a day of judgment coming, that God is going to judge the world. Or, or you think of Paul writing to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. He talks about the righteous judgment of God. He talks about the day when the Lord Jesus is, is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God or in those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of His might. That's the message of the New Testament. It is the message of the Bible. And in a sense, we are not being honest with people. We are not being totally honest with our friends. If we withhold that message from them, there is a day coming. It may not be 40 days from now, as the message was to Nineveh. It's actually more frightening because we do not know whether it's 40 seconds from now, or 40 minutes from now, or 40 months from now, or 40 years from now. We don't know when it's going to be, but God has appointed a time in which He will judge the world by the Lord Jesus Christ, the very one whom we offer as the way of escape will be the means of judgment on that last day. And I want to say that I think this is a message. I wonder, as, as, as uh, 
as Jonah went to Nineveh, I wonder what he would have expected to happen as he went to deliver that message. I wonder if we would have expected mockery. That people would have been laughing at what he was saying. I wonder if he would have expected rejection from people as he spoke out his message. Or perhaps even worse than that, a bunch of thugs hired to get him in a corner somewhere and give him a beating or perhaps even do him to death. And as we go out with the message of judgment, we, we go with the same fears or the same concerns. Those are very much the kinds of reaction that we, that we have uh, from people today. The reason that people object, of course, is A, they don't believe in God, and B, if they did believe in God, they believe in a God that accords to the wisdom of this world. He's a God who is actually not all that displeased with us. The world in its wisdom does not know God. And so we're told that Jonah went to this great city and he cried out, he cried out against it. You see, Nineveh was under the wrath of God. These people were not only outside of the chosen people. They weren't Jews. They were the sworn enemies of Israel. Assyria, Nineveh is the capital of Assyria. Assyria is the biggest threat to the national survival of God's people. You can see why Jonah perhaps hesitated to go and speak to them. Somebody has written about Nineveh this. In God's mind, Nineveh is not a quantity, but a quality. Not a mere metropolis, but an immorality. He takes the symbol of the ancient world's most impressive evil, magnifies it, and intensifies it by mass, and sends his prophet into the midst of it. Jonah goes into the city. He heads for the city center and he proclaims a message of judgment. And there is a sense in which that is the message we have to proclaim to people today. Can you imagine going on primetime t- television, late night, one of these late night shows, and being asked what it is that the church has to say to America today? It's been appointed to men once to die and after that judgment. The Lord Jesus is going to be revealed with his flaming angels to judge the world. Well, you can imagine they'd have switched you off and gone to somebody else by the time you'd got all that out in a sentence. And that's the reality. That's what we find Jonah doing. What did he expect? He did not expect what happened. Suddenly, The unpredictable happens. Through the proclamation of Jonah, a light goes on in the heads of these people. What he has said will happen does not happen. Instead, there is this mass movement of repentance from the top to the bottom of society. Look at what it says. The people of Jonah believed God. That was incredible. They did the opposite of what Jonah had been telling them what happened. Forty days now the judgment will fall. And in 40 days the judgment did not fall. The prophet of God would be embarrassed. He'd be even more embarrassed as he saw the widespread take up of this repentance. They called a fast from the greatest of them to the least of them. The people believed God. The word reached the king of Nineveh who got up out of his throne and removed his robes and covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. From the highest to the lowest, from the greatest in the land to the deplorables, he got them all, all of them, brought to repentance. It isn't just the simple, uneducated, I was going to say Baptist, but that would have been bad, so I'm not going to say that. But you know, it isn't the simplest and most uneducated member of society that needs to hear that there is judgment to come, that there is a hell to be feared. It is from the least to the greatest 
that need to hear this message. There is no one in this room so intellectually exalted that you don't need to hear that there is a judgment coming. It is for everyone, this message. And what happens? These people believed God. They heard Jonah, but they believed God. They saw beyond the man, and they heard the Word of God, and they believed God. They believed what He said was going to happen, would happen. And a miracle is taking place. The hand of God can be seen in the faith of these people, in the, in the belief of these people. Faith is a gift of God, the Bible says. Faith is the product in the human heart of the supernatural, unseen work of the Holy Spirit, creating faith in people's hearts. And so God, the Holy Spirit, works alongside God's holy word through His servant in this very powerful way, through these secret operations in the hearts of men and women, and they believed God. Faith often works energetically in our hearts, and it works usually according to the matter in which we believe. So, these people believed there was judgment coming, so they reacted. They believed in fear to begin with. They believed in fear. They were afraid of what was going to happen. And that's all right as a first step. Fear is something that prompts us to take action. But not only did they respond in fear, but their faith responded in hope. Look at verse 9. Who knows, they asked, who knows God may turn and relent and turn from His fierce anger so that we may not perish? there was a kindling of hope in their heart. Now, where did that come from? That did not come naturally. It wasn't some natural eruption of a latent hopefulness or a latent trust in God that emerged without the work of the Holy Spirit producing it. Because, as the Bible tells us, Again and again, the apostle writes, the God of this age blinds the minds of those who do not believe. So this is a work of God, creating not only a fear of judgment, but a hope of mercy. Now, where did they get that hope of mercy? In uh, Matthew, the Lord Jesus is confronted by the scribes and the Pharisees who come to him and say, teacher, we would like you to do some sign. We'd like a sign from you as to help us believe what you're saying. I mean, we're the religious elite, we're the professionally religious people here, and we're not going to be taken in with all the stuff that these ordinary folks are, are being taken in with, so we would like a sign that would convince us. Jesus replies, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. But no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up on the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. What is Jesus suggesting there? He's suggesting that the people of Nineveh knew the story of Jonah. So as Jonah's going around, he's not only delivering his short, pithy, pointed message 40 days from now, but he's illustrating his message. He's saying to these people, you may not believe in judgment. Well, let me tell you about judgment. God spoke to me. I disobeyed God. I went the opposite direction from the direction God told me to go. And did I get off with it? No. 
He hunted me down. He hunted me down to the very boat that I took. He hunted me down into the depths of the sea. He hunted me down into the belly of the fish. He hunted me down till I was spewed up in dry, dry land. The judgment of God gets you in the end. And as they listened to his testimony, as they listened to his story, they believed God. They believed God. They came to this view, perhaps, if God could show mercy to Jonah, God can show mercy to Nineveh. And by good and necessary consequence, they hoped in mercy and believed God. And there's a sense in which this morning that's where all of us start. That's where we have to begin. That's where we're being led in all the influences in our lives. And every sermon we've heard, every word of Scripture we've read, every Christian friend that has crossed our path, the influence of God's people in the world, all of this is to bring you to this place where you believe God. Not only for fear, but also for hope in His promises. Here was a people under judgment. Here was a people who came to believe. And here was a people who were pardoned freely by God. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that He said would happen to them, and He did not do it. Well, let me just tell you something. Some people have had a field day with that text. Let me explain what I mean. Some people have picked up on this idea that God is a God who changes His mind. There was about a decade ago, it still rumbles on in the background, a, a debate that was called the openness of God debate. Uh, Dr. Riken wrote some stuff on our website addressing that very effectively so. And in this openness of God debate, there were those who argued that God doesn't know the future, that God doesn't have a script, that God is a reactive God. He reacts to things that are happening in the world. He goes with the flow. He rolls with the punches. He doesn't know what's going to happen tomorrow to you. He doesn't know how you're going to respond to Him today. He's learning as He goes. Well, there's another group. It's called the theistic mutualism group. The key word is the mutual thing. Uh, these people believe very strongly that God does not change in Himself, but that He does change in His emotions, in His feelings, and that He's learning He's learning from his interaction. That's the mutual aspect. He's learning from his interactions with people. And he's accumulating new attributes as he interacts with us in our everyday lives. Theistic mutualism. But what does the Bible teach? And what has the church always believed, actually? The Bible, the Bible teaches and the church has believed that God is unchanged and unchanging in His being, who He is, in His essence, and in His activity, especially towards His creatures. So, for example, when God says, I am, that's an absolute statement, I am. Not I am becoming, not I will be or have been, but that He simply exists. He exists. He is in act. He is in existence. He is the I am. What we mean by that is that God is not contingent. Our existence is not absolute. Our existence is contingent. Your mom and your dad had to meet. You have to have breath to breathe oxygen to breathe. You know, you'll, you'll survive if you're on planet Earth. You will not survive on Venus or Mars without a lot of help. All of our existence, in fact, even the universe 
existing at this moment is dependent on this moment's thought and word of God. But God is not contingent on anything. There is nothing God needs. Because God is Trinity. That's the New Testament explanation. He's not the God of Islam. He is Trinity. And He is perfectly happy and blessed in Himself. Let me spell it out for you for a moment. The eternal life of the Trinity is perfect life. If you ever thought that God made things because He got bored, you're wrong. God was never bored, nor was He lonely. He didn't make us because He wanted company. In what Fred Sanders calls the happy land of the Trinity, things are never dull and God is never lonely. The eternal life of the Trinity is perfect life. The eternal life of the Trinity is perfect love. The tri-personal God does not need someone to love. He is complete in and of Himself. When we talk about the love of God, it's not like romantic love. Ro romantic love is often is prompted, isn't it, by, by something in the beloved. If you're really superficial, if you're really superficial, it's prompted by how they look. If you're marginally less superficial, it's how they look and how bright they are. Or if you're marginally not that superficial, it, it might be a number of other qualities that you see in them. But we, romantic love is prompted by what we see in somebody else. And you've really got to real love, I think, when you love someone for who they are, in the fullness of what they are, in such a way that you love them and there is no possibility that any variation in them will ever change your love for them. That is not love that alters when it alteration finds. God's love is not like that. From all eternity, God has had a son to love in the Holy Spirit. Perfect love. Perfect glory. The eternal glory of the Trinity is perfect glory. God did not need to create creatures to whom He could show Himself off. The glory of the Father was always enjoyed by the Son, and the glory of the Son was always enjoyed by the Father. You can't get more enjoyment than God's enjoyment. That glory is eternal. So what does God have to say for Himself? Here's what He says, I am the Lord, I change not. Here's what the psalmist says of Him, Psalm 102, everything else will perish, but you remain. You are the same. Or in James 1, God is the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. He doesn't change. That means all that He is doesn't change. Holy, good, knowledgeable, wise, powerful, changeless. One of the church fathers, Gregory of Nicaea, or Nicaea, recognized that God was, quote, incapable of changing to worse or changing to better. If He changed for the better, then He was not God before. If he's able to change to the worst, then he's no longer, he can no longer be conceived of as God. You see this kind of thing right throughout Scripture. The book of Job, for example. Is it any pleasure to the Almighty if you are in the right? Is it gain to him if you make your way blameless? In other words, if you're, if you're in the right, if you're a good person, and your way is blameless and so on, does that give God does that actually give God pleasure? I mean, we say that, don't we? We, we use this, and we'll see in a moment why we, we use this kind of language, but in an absolute sense, does that give Him anything? The Bible con contradicts that. We don't give Him something He doesn't already have in Himself as, eternal, as an eternal quality. Here's how John Calvin put it. We give Him no gain. We can do Him no good. 
We can do him no harm, nor does he receive any commodity from us as though he had need of it. When God calls us to obey him or praise him or serve him, it's not for his sake, it's for our sake. As Calvin puts it, as for God, he always remains safe and sound. He doesn't lose anything or gain anything. He has everything. So in the book of Job, his, uh, com Job's complaint was this. Surely the righteous by being righteous are owed a hearing from God. God uh, sends his, his friends along. And they say to him, if you've sinned, what do you accomplish against God? If your transgressions are multiplied, what do you do to him? Do you actually do him any harm? Of course not. If you're righteous, what do you give to him? Do you add to his righteousness if you're righteous? And God himself comes into the question when he says, who has first given to me that I should repay him? Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. You can't take from me and you can't give to me. God exists in and of himself. And I don't think it's put any clearer than it is by the Apostle Paul and Mars Hill in Athens when he says this, the God who made the world and everything in it, being the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temple made by hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Let me spell it out to us. God did not make you because he needed you. God doesn't ask you to praise him because he needs praised. He made you because it pleased him to make you. It was his will to make you. He gets you to praise him so that you, in praising, may discover more of him and be blessed by it. But it doesn't add anything to him. In Malachi 3, I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, O children of Jacob, you are not consumed. God is unchanging in his word. He keeps his word. But what do we do then with a passage like this that says when God saw what they did, God relented of the disaster? What do we do with that kind of language? Well, let me just mention in passing a passage in 1 Samuel 15 where the Lord says to Samuel about King Saul, I regret that I have made Saul king. And then later on God says to Saul, listen, the glory of Israel, that's himself, the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have regret. Now, those two juxtaposed passages of the Bible are telling you something. They're telling you that the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, whose wisdom is unsearchable, who knows the end from the beginning, may appear to regret, may appear to change his mind. But he is saying to you that absolutely considered, he never changes his mind. He never repents. You see, the revelation that we have in the Bible is revelation that is brought down to the level of creatures. It's brought down to our level. Calvin says God's engaging in baby talk as he stoops over, as it were, to our point of view and describes things from our vantage point. He knows that we live beneath the sun. He knows that we think, I mean, most people until the last couple of hundred years have believed that the sun rose and the sun set, so he talks in the language. In fact, we still talk like that. I've heard Dawkins, the, the scientist, talk about sunrise. He knows perfectly well the sun doesn't rise. 
But that's human language. It's from our perspective. So God comes and he speaks at our level. The Bible talks about anthropomorphisms. That is, God uses forms to describe himself. Do you think for one minute God has a finger? Or a hand? Or an arm? Or has eyes? Or has ears? God has none of those things. He is spirit, and he is invisible, and he is immaterial. He is not made of the created stuff that we are made. Jesus illustrates this. When he commands evil spirits to come out of people with his word, he says, if I by the finger of God, no finger was involved, it was his word that did it. He's using it as a metaphor. He's bringing it down to our level and using it in that sense. And that's the same with anthropopathisms. That is human feelings. God is accommodating to our language. So when we find God appearing to change, we're seeing that from our perspective. And I think you can see this even from the text. You have to ask yourself, if God has changed, what has changed? Well, God's will has changed. Really? What was God's will? Well, Jonah's told to preach 40 days and you'll be nuked. Then if that was God's will, why has God sent Jonah? Why has God gone to all this plan, all this problem of calling Jonah, Jonah running, God chasing, Jonah getting on a ship, God chasing the ship, God throwing a storm, God getting the fish ordered, so the fish is there at the right moment to capture him, swallow him, protect him, submerge with him, and then throw him up. Why has God gone to all this bother and then come a second time to Jonah and said, go to that great city and call out to it? Why? Because the God who had determined to judge Nineveh had determined that he would save some people. In Nineveh. Amen. The long term judgment, by the way, was going to happen. Nineveh was obliterated. It's just, as far as I'm told by some of our mission partners who, uh, who visited there and, and uh, live near there, it's just, it's just sand today in the desert. It's all gone. God's word came true. The word through Nahum, the prophet, who tells about the end and destruction of Nineveh. But God had also planned that he would use the preaching of his prophet Jonah to call Nineveh to this repentance. Just like he said about the world we live in, this society, this city in which we live, that there's coming a day of judgment, but God has sent us into the world to do what? To call to people, to come to Christ. We don't know when that day is going to come. So right now we call on men, we, we warn them of what is coming, and God is pleased to use us the way, he used, the way He used this prophet who was unprofitable in so many ways. God uses a slow, recalcitrant, selfish, unbelieving, narrow-minded, error-driven church, ridden church. He puts the treasure of the gospel into earthenware jars, because he has many people here that he's going to call to himself. The reality is we don't know the full mind of God. And how it appears to us is uh, because we are looking at God from our human perspective. Well, we have a great message to take to our Nineveh. Now, Joseph, by, by going there, Jonah is fulfilling the great task that God announced to Abraham that in him all the nations, all the families of the earth would be blessed. 
Jonah is inadvertently carrying out the messianic task. He's taking the message to another people group, the Assyrians. And he's seeing that the God who spared Israel can spare pagans. It's one of those hints in the Bible of God's bigger plan that he was going to bring people of every nation and culture and language, bring them into the kingdom of God. So that comes down to us here today. What's God's message to you this morning? I think it's summarized by Isaiah, the prophet. Turn to me, says the Lord. Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Or in the words of Paul, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And how are you saved? The same way these people were spared. They believed God. And you will be saved if you hear beyond the words of a mere mortal speaking to you. The voice of God speaking to you. And you believe God. You will be spared. Not only spared but given eternal life, joy unspeakable, and full of glory. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would take your word. We rest on your unchanging nature. We wouldn't want a God who loved us one minute and didn't the next. A God that we could influence we, so much better to know that you who are against sin are against sin because you are holy. And if you love us, you love us because you are love. And if we give you glory, it's not to give you something because you are glorious. And we bow before your majesty and adore you and ask for your mercy. Mercy on this nation, mercy on these people. We cry to you in Jesus' name. Amen.